So <clears throat> we've uh, had some discussions today already in the Bible study, and I heard some comments regarding 1888, uh, 1889, and actually what we're going to focus on today is 1887, which is the year before um, 1889, and the relevance of that and what took place then, and um, one of the things that I feel um, is important today is that in 1888, like was, it was rightly said earlier by somebody that um, everything was in place, right? For Jesus to come back. And there wasn't a people ready. And we are still to this day in 1888. Nothing has changed because the same lessons that God wanted his people to understand then, he still wants them to understand today. And we haven't moved from this as a people. And we know that 1888 was revolving around the messages of um, Jones and Wagner on righteousness by faith. And we still, to this day, kind of get caught up in the debates on you know, what that message was, you know, there's always this idea of Jones and Wagner had a message, and then they apostatized, and then they had a different message. And so what you see today, a lot of times is you see the messages of Jones and Wagner against the messages of Jones and Wagner. And um, especially in the corporate churches, uh, you'll have one church pitted against another because they believe Jones and Wagner in the 1890s, and then they have the Jones and Wagner messages of the 1900s in another church. And I saw this in San Diego growing up. And, um, but I think there's some other issues that we can, that we can understand. And I believe God has led me to an understanding of a few things about 1888. And so um, it is on my heart to share these things and I will stand in my place and, um, Try to faithfully give these messages as they are brought to me. And in Ellen White's entire, I don't know what to say, her 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 days of ministry. I was almost going to say her career, but in her days of ministry, and she spoke a lot. And she says that the very theme of all of her messages revolved around righteousness by faith. And it was a central theme of her discourses. Now, I'm not saying it's of her writings, of everything. I mean, she just says when she spoke in maybe the churches, in the camp meetings, in the general conference, behind everything that she was saying, she was trying to put forth the righteousness of Christ. And we know that in 1888, um, that Jones and Wagner were, were, or just prior to that, Jones and Wagner were being raised up with this truth as well. And 1888 really happened over one point of the message, and that was really Wagner's um, take on the law in Galatians. And this whole thing was stirred up by just this one point. And we're not going to look at that one point today. Um, I actually, this is, this is part one of a series. And uh, if you are blessed by this and you want to hear the rest, we can do that at some point. But we're going to start here with two letters. And these are in 1887. Because we're leading up to Minneapolis here. And um, before I start, though, I just want to pray one more time, if that's okay. Let's just bow our heads for a minute. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Father, we need from you the importance of the message to be put upon our hearts, Father, the things that you would have us to understand, to learn, to be moved by. Father, your message without your spirit attending is pointless. 
Father, hide me behind the cross and help us all to have ears to hear what you have to say to each one, every one of us individually. Thank you, Father, for your presence being here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, at this point in 1887, Ellen White was in Basel, Switzerland. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's spelled like Basel, but I think it's pronounced Basel. And um, the Lord was impressing upon her the upcoming meetings the, the following year. And um, she talks about having some insight from the Lord that um, some things needed to be addressed prior to everybody coming together. And so Ellen White you know, we're, we're, we're looking at these two letters particularly today, and these are the original um, links to these letters. Now, these two letters also make up chapter one and chapter two of the 1888 materials. Now, there is three letters in the 1888 materials from 1887, and I left one out um, so the first letter was to Joan, uh, E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. The second letter was to G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith. The third letter was to the delegates that were going to attend the conference. The reason why I left that out um, is because there's no original source on that, on that letter. And I don't know what to make of that, but... Um, it's only sources in the 1888 materials, and yet that's a compilation done by the Ellen White estate. So I'm just going to stick with the two letters um, that has an original source, if that's okay. Not saying that there's anything wrong with the other letter. I just, I don't know. I'm just not comfortable with doing that unless I know where it's from. So these two letters, of course, are to the two parties that are at, at odds with each other. Okay, so Ellen White was to travel to 1888 with Jones and Wagner. And it's interesting in these letters to understand that she speaks to both parties in a way that, um, that, is, that is a little astonishing because she doesn't choose sides in these letters. She has um, both admonition and support for both sides, for both parties. And so in the letter to Jones and Wagner, and I, and I encourage everybody here to read these letters because I think they're, I think they're quite powerful. And once you hear this message and then go back and read through them, I think you'll be blessed by it. But Jones and Wagner were warned um, in their letter that while Ellen G. White supported their message, she also did not support everything they shared as some things were divisive. So she was making that statement pre-1888. Now that's not a statement to what was shared in 1888 at the conference itself. She's just saying that coming up to this point, there are some things that I can't, I can't get behind because they seem to be a little divisive. Now on the other, on the other spectrum with uh, Butler and Uriah, who were president and vice president of the general conference at that time, they were warned that they exhibited no love of their brethren, even on points when they were correct. And it's interesting to note that she did side with them on the law of Galatians issue. Um, but what it, the very fact that she wrote to them and told them this is supported and emphasized by the fact that Uriah Smith in particular would block Wagner from speaking everywhere that they were both at. So if Uriah was there, and Wagner was scheduled to speak, he would block him. He would censor him. It wouldn't allow him to speak. And Ellen White was very unfavorable of this. 
And of course, she didn't support one side over the other. She, she did have these admonitions of both sides, but then she also gave support to both sides in these letters. I'm not going to go too deep. Uh, we're going to see some of the things in these letters that I think are um, are going to are going to open our minds to maybe an important point that we didn't realize leading up to 1888. I want to begin by looking at what Ellen G. White said our focus should be, and this is from the very first chapter, the very first letter. Uh, there are the main pillars of our faith, subjects which are of vital interest, the Sabbath, the keeping of the commandments of God. Speculative ideas should not be agitated, for there are peculiar minds that love to get some point that others do not accept and argue and attract everything to that one point, urging that point, magnifying that point, when it is really a matter which is not of vital importance and will be understood differently. Twice I have been shown that everything of a character to cause our brethren to be diverted from the very points now essential for this time should be kept in the background. I did fail to mention um, before I started this that we are gonna be heavy in the spirit of prophecy today. And um, I think that's obvious because we're dealing with 1888, amen. Um, although I think that there are principles in the Bible that support everything that is, that is we're, we're looking at today, but we're looking specifically at the testimony of the end time prophet telling us about the situation at hand as it's, as, as it's unfolding. And so it's interesting that she says that there are the main pillars of our faith. These, are, these subjects are of vital interest, and we have seven pillars of our faith. We have the law of God, and at the heart of that is the Sabbath. We have the faith of Jesus. We have the personality of God in Christ, which we know the Trinity uh, attacks. So it attacks one of the pillars of our faith. And then you have the central pillar, which is the sanctuary connected to the 2300 day prophecy. And then you have the non immortality of the wicked. And then you have the three, the three angels messages. And finally you have the testimony of Jesus. And so these seven pillars hold up this platform of truth. And this platform of truth is, you know, you could say, rest on top of that is our fundamental principles that were laid out these, these were the things that our church came together in the early years and developed through much time of prayer and study and coming together and putting aside differences and understanding that everybody is coming to a, an understanding of truth um, coming out of error and there was much differences of opinions on many things but through all that um, and we all know about the history of the early years of our church through all that, we were given this, these fundamental principles that were not intended to be a creed, right? They were not intended to be, um, a basis by which you would be accepted or rejected. But it's important to know that she put this in this letter because there are things that are going around even in her time and even in our time that are off of the seven pillars and are very, uh, and the, um, these fundamental principles, right? So we have uh, these side issues that are, coming up that do not fit in either of these. She says, twice I have been shown that everything of a character to cause our brethren to be diverted from the very points now essential for this time should be kept in the background. And I wonder how, how often we are thinking about this as a people. 
right? You know, the, the term present truth, we're all familiar with this term. And we can see it so much more fully when we read this particular statement. She says twice, not once, but twice. So there's two witnesses, right? Twice I have been shown that everything of a character to cause our brethren to be diverted from the very points that are now essential for this time. Otherwise, in other words, present truth should be kept in the background. She goes on to say, we are one in faith in the fundamental truths of God's word. And one object must be kept in view constantly. That is harmony and cooperation must be maintained without compromising one principle of truth. But one principle of what truth? I mean, there are truths that we hold that are not particularly present truth, right? So we have these seven pillars which hold up this platform of truth. And yet we could, we could probably, I mean, I, I don't like to use the word compromise, but if we're dealing with truths outside of those, of those things, um, I believe that um, we need to look past this idea that we all must come into conformity all the way down the line. We'll see more about that as we go on though. So unity, right? Harmony and cooperation through present truth, right? Is the, which is essential for our time as found in our fundamental truths, right? Which is a reference to our fundamental principles. Um, we all know that the fundamental principles were changed to the fundamental beliefs. And why, wh why did they change the word principles to beliefs? You know, a principle is something that you can find in the word of God. You can see it. You can see it interwoven through scripture. You can, you can study it line upon line, precept upon precept. You can see it. But a belief yeah, it's kind of, you know, it could be, it could be manipulated, correct? So they had to change that word because when they introduced the Trinity into the fundamental principles, they know that they could not establish it as a principle from the word of God. And so the very word fundamental, meaning is an adjective pertaining to the foundation or basis serving for the foundation, hence essential. See, our fundamental principles are essential. They're foundational, uh, important as a fundamental truth or principle. The only thing that could bring us to unity through these truths, though, is the spirit of Christ. Um, if, it, if unity can be achieved through his spirit, I ask you, what is hindering us? We are to be bound to one another in sacred bonds of holy union. But it is the work of the enemy to create a, say it with me, party spirit and to have party feelings. And some feel that they are doing the work of God and strengthening prejudice prejudices and jealousies among brethren. And this is a very important, these are very, two very important words, party spirit. It's not just seen here, but it's a party spirit is like political, right? It's very much like politics. The carnal part of us, of man, wants to support party leaders, wants to resonate with something, right? Um, whether it be speakers, ministers, ministries, um, et cetera. So what we have today is we have a lot of fragmented one true God believers. We have people in different camps. We have a party spirit. We have Naderites and Masonites and McCaffreyites PHMites, Smyrnaites, and it goes on and on and on. This is a very, 
real thing. And everybody is divided along these different lines with just minor variations. And I'm, I'm personally affected by this because I have friends that are dear and close to me that I love very much that are on both sides of differing issues. And it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to see, but it is, as it says here, the work of the enemy to create these things. We don't just see it here. When we go to Acts of the Apostles, speaking on the work that was uh, done after Pentecost, we read this. There was danger that this party spirit would result in great evil to the Christian church. And Paul was instructed by the Lord to utter words of earnest admonition and solemn protest of those who were saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. The apostle, the apostle inquired, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Let no man glory in men, he pleaded, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. Every man is given a different gift than another, but we judge each other by each other as if we are all with the same gifts. Um, what we see here is that Paul, who we know, we know how knowledgeable Paul was. We know his writings. We know how we've all experienced uh, the mental twister we have to play to understand Paul's writings, right? Sometimes. Um, but in this, in this scenario, Paul was tasked in planting the seed using the milk of the word in Corinth, right? So he was sent into Corinth first and he was laying the, just the, the most basic layer down, right? And he was planting those seeds. But Apollos was sent after him to water and he was, he came with a, with a stronger meat, right? He came and built upon that, right? So he, so Paul came with the early rain. Apollos came more with the last. I mean, I'm just using this as an, as an example, but there is there is a correlation here to to a different work that is being achieved, and and the problem is is that many at that time were saying Apollos was greater than Paul and followed him because he delivered the the results right because with his message a great harvest was obtained. But we have to remember that no matter what our work is, no matter what we are called to do, God always provides the increase, amen? And any of our petty judgments of each other um, regarding the work that God has put on our hearts to do is only doing harm to God's work. And um, I firmly believe that. Um, we still are seeing a lot of the devastating effects of what a party spirit does in the work today. We must keep before the world a united front. This is what we are told. Satan will triumph to see differences among, yeah, I mean, who's the Seventh-day Adventist? Is the corporate church? I mean, a name only, right? Who is the Seventh-day Adventist? We are, aren't we? I would say those who still carry the oracles of truth as were defined in the early years of our church, right? And so Satan will triumph over seeing these differences among us. And um, I think he is triumphant, triumphant in some aspects right now. He's very happy with what he is seeing in the landscape. Do we have a united front today? I'm asking every one of you. Um, 
you know, since the Trinity is contrary to our fundamental principles, therefore we cannot really unite with the so-called corporate SDA church, can we? Um, that's the great dilemma, right? I know, I know about, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of people that I care about in that church. And I do believe that we have a great work of calling them out. I do believe that's connected to the fourth angel's message that we are calling these people out of even the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we are to call them out of that fallen system, just as the reformers were to do the same thing coming out of the Catholic church and even out of some of the Protestant churches as they started to fall. And speaking of this Reformation, we are told that the Reformation was greatly retarded by making prominent differences on some points of faith in each party, right? You have these, you have these different parties again, holding tenaciously to those things where they differed. And so, once again, we see here that uh, this work of party spirit is working against what God is trying to achieve. And the word prominent there, um, the pro it, by making prominent these differences, um, prominent is distinguishing above all other things. That's what it means. So we're taking a point of, a, a different point on an aspect of our faith and then we're making it prominent and we're distinguishing it above all other things. And we, I give the example of, um, because we've had clear counsel on this and uh, I give the example of the flat earth, right? Um, some people, now I don't mind if people hold a flat earth theory, okay? I really don't. It doesn't affect my salvation. It doesn't affect what I believe. Where it becomes dangerous is when you try to tell me it's salvational. And that goes with anything else. Because if it is salvational, then it would put it would have been put in the great structure of our truth or the framework of our truth. It would have been in the pillars. It would have been in the uh, fundamental principles. We would know that these things are important because God makes it known to us. And I'm of the opinion that uh, whatever God wants us to know, then he's going to speak about it a lot. And the things that don't matter as much, we don't hear a lot about. And you really have to like dig deep to find things about it, right? And like, so the things that are really important, there's a lot of information given to us, you know, like the Sabbath, right? We have just an abundance of information on the Sabbath because it's, it's, important it's going to be the test question but we are doing the same thing today instead of coming together in unity of our fundamental principles we quibble over non-essential divisive issues we make them prominent and salvational sister white said regarding this um my husband james white had some ideas on some points differing from the views taken by his brethren. And I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call him, call for him to put them in front before his brethren and create differences of ideas. I'm gonna let that sink in for a minute. If you are a studious person, and especially with the Trinitarian message, you would have made this observation at some point that Ellen White does not talk about the Trinity. But James White was very prolific about the topic. And so it's interesting when I read this, it says, I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call for him to put them in front of before his brethren and create differences of ideas. Which is interesting. I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but um, I'm not saying that anybody is wrong for ministering the idea of um, non-Trinitarianism. I'm not saying that. Um, I believe that this subject is the omega of apostasy. I believe that 
it is our duty to call people out of this, you know, most dangerous air. But he, she goes on to say, while he might hold these views subordinate himself, once they are made public, minds would seize upon them. And just because others believe differently would make these differences the whole burden of the message and get up contention and variance. And of course, we see this on Facebook. And I've been, I've been on, uh, I, I've been on, on that problem myself. I, I've been guilty of that myself. Um, where all of my posts were the burden of that message, and all I was receiving was contention and variance. So the question I ask myself is, is there a, a better way to go about um, teaching this subject or any subject that we know is truth? Um, if we taught the fundamental principles the way that they are, if we taught fundamental principle number one on who God is being the father and, it, and just it's truth alone and not even mentioning the Trinity, right? But letting the truth stand alone on its own. Um, I don't know. That's just a that's just a thought that I have. Uh, that would be a great point of discussion after the message, because I'd be curious to find everybody else's thoughts on that. And so, uh, what we just read here, of course, is what happened in 1888. Um, if we take any truth out of the great framework and magnify it above all others, it then it becomes our gospel, right? And yes, even the personality of God in Christ can be. Um, there are other quotes that I have read where she states that her husband did not always follow counsel along these lines. Um, but I do believe that... Um, I do believe to be truth as to why James speaks so much regarding the Trinity and Ellen did not. She did make this statement. If there is difference upon any part, any parts of the message, or I'm sorry, of the understanding of some particular passage of scripture, then do not be with pen or voice making your differences apparent and making a breach when there is no need of this. And this is what was happening in 1880. This is what was happening regarding um, the law of Galatians. And um, there's a lot more that I, I, I'd like to say, but it's in the, it's in the next presentation um, regarding that. Um, but we need to pray for great wisdom regarding these statements, I believe. Um, what I do know is that arguments and debates make a breach when we go beyond what we are called to do, no matter how truthful they are. That's what Ellen White was saying about her husband. No matter how right you are, no matter how truthful it is, when we get into the, into the sphere of argument and debate, I mean, picture Christ. Do we see that in the life of Christ and the work of Christ? We don't. In fact, there was many times where he said, uh, there's many things I want to tell you right now, but you are not ready to receive them. You cannot bear them now. So I think that Sister White's silence can carry as much weight as her words on any given subject. There has been a door thrown open for variance and strife and contention and differences, which none of you can see, but God. His eye traces the beginning to the end, and the magnitude of mischief God alone knows. The bitterness, the wrath, the resentment, the jealousies, the heart burnings provoked by controversies of both sides of the question causes the loss of many souls. And I think it's interesting that she states that there are two sides of the question, right? And is there a winner? Probably not. There's probably only losers. Um, this It's important to realize that this statement is at the crux of the two letters. This is the point of what she's trying to get across in these two letters. 
there are controversies on both sides of this issue. There is no side which is right, she says. The party spirit might be described by Walter Weith as the devil in pink or the devil in blue, right? We've all heard him say that. And speaking of the devil, he's, uh, it goes on to say that I know that Satan's work will be to set brethren at variance. And we see that right now. And so Satan is victorious right now. And how long do we want to give Satan the victory? I mean, we've still been giving Satan the victory since 1888. We have been divided by the party spirit. And I, it begs the question, how can we take the victory back? She says, and mind you, this is all still in the same two letters that we've been reading. Truths connected with the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven will be talked of, written upon more than now. So she's saying these truths that are connected to what? Our time. Because aren't we living in the time just before Christ comes in the clouds of heaven? So the truths that are connected with this time, which is present truth, right? This is just another way of her saying, the truths that are present truth to us right now will be talked of more, written upon more than now. There is to be closed every door that will lead to points of difference and debate among brethren. If the old man was purged, see, this is, the, this is at the heart of it, right? Because when you have people at variance and you have people at odds and passionately debating and in contention, right? That old man is rising up in us. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to make you see my point no matter what, right? And I've been guilty of that. Amen. Have you, uh, do, you under, do, you have, do you feel like you've been guilty of that too? I know I have. If the old man was purged from every heart, then there would be greater safety in discussion. And, and, and that's what it is, right? Discussion. That, so when, when the early church came together and they had these points of differences, they had greater safety in discussion. Why? Because they didn't have, the old man was purged, right? They, they approached um, finding truth, not from, the, not from the viewpoint of, I've got my truth, you've got yours, but I'm going to make you see my point, right? Um, but now the people need something of a different character, and that's what we're seeing today. There is altogether too little of the love of Christ in the hearts of those who claim to believe the truth. And I think that that's an important statement. That's why I highlighted it in red. I can almost see Christ telling us that himself. Um, while all their hopes are centered in Jesus Christ, while his spirit pervades the soul, then there will be unity. Although, don't miss this point, my brothers and sisters. Please don't miss this point. Although every idea may not be exactly the same on all points. Amen? Can you say amen to that? I know it seems contrary to some people's thinking. I have heard people say that I only want to fellowship with those who believe in the truth at every point in the Bible, every truth that there is. If you're not coming under conformity to every truth in the Bible, then I don't want to fellowship. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding when I've heard, when I tell you I've heard people say this. But there is a truth that is important that we must unify on, right? We have been given these truths for our time. And I think that if we just focused on those truths, we can find unity as a people. We can get away from these party spirits. And although every idea may not be exactly the same, so maybe this person believes in the feast. Maybe that person believes in the flat earth. Maybe that, you know, as, but you know what? If they personally hold to that, I would leave them in the hands of the Lord because we know that the, the disciples had a lot of variance in what they believed and, and they were at war with each other. And when the outpouring at Pentecost took place, a lot of that fell by the wayside, didn't it? 
And I really believe that we're going to see that again. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. We're going to see what took place at Pentecost happen again today, and maybe even in a greater measure. But I do believe we can have unity in my church family as a people. Uh, God is calling us to put away our differences, right, of opinions, and to unite on the established truths prominent for our time, which all point to the life, the work, and the character of our Savior. I mean, that's really, I think all of our truths do that for our time. Um, all of it is in preparation of understanding this, this message of righteousness by faith. Um, the righteousness of Christ, the faith of Jesus. You know, there's another point in the 1888 materials, and I don't remember where, where it was specifically, but uh, the original location, but she says, we do not understand the faith of Jesus. We talk about it. We, we use it, but we don't understand it. She says, when we do understand the faith of Jesus, there's going to be a power associated with it. And I pray for that. To have unity and love for one another is the great work now to be carried on. And see, when we are, when we are focused on doctrine, we are focused on trying to get people to see things the way that we, that we, the way we see it we kind of get to this place where we lose sight of love for one another. We lose, you know, we're not really exhibiting it. We're not feeling it for each other. Um, the work is suffering. We are suffering as a people because witnessing isn't about what we know. It's about how we interact with people. It's about how we exhibit love for our fellow man. And we can't love God if we can't love our fellow man. Amen. I really believe that. Um, oh, if the hearts were only subdued by the spirit of God, if the eye was single to God's glory, what a flood of heavenly light would pour upon the soul. And I put this in here because I thought it, it just kind of struck me when I read it that our eyes should be singular to Christ and the Father and, their, and, and the character. And yet we spend so much time looking at one another and judging one another's ministries, their habits, their, their failings, their sins. Um, but we need, we need to remember the, the parable of the Pharisee and the, and the publican, right? So the Pharisee was looking at the publican and saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not like that guy, right? And I know this is just a parable, but I think Christ was trying to teach us a lesson, a very strong lesson. And that was, you know, his focus was on his own self-righteousness. And remember, we're talking about a message here uh, in 1888, which is Christ's righteousness. And in that parable, we are seeing the example of that. So the Pharisee has his own self-righteousness. And he's saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm not a sinful person like that guy. And the publican is saying, there is nothing in me that's worthy of anything. And I am a, I am a failed sinner. And he smote his breast and he, and he wouldn't even so much as look up because he knew his sense. But Jesus said that man went home and he was covered by Christ's robe of righteousness. I, I guarantee you. I mean, I mean, it wasn't a real story, but I'm, but the point is, is that we need to be understanding of what was really taking place in 1888 because amidst all of this dissension all this strife all this variance was a lot of self-righteousness 
And so while they're arguing over points of doctrine, they're missing the point. They are minoring in the majors and majoring in the minors, as Ellen White would put it. And we all know what Christ's prayer was, right? That we would all be one as he and his father are one. And if we're going to do that, we need a greater sense of humility as a people. I know I do. I pray for this every day. Um, what a work that needs to be done in me. And so I can't even, I can't even bother with thinking of somebody else. when I got so many things that God needs to work out in me. But if the eye was single to God's glory, if our eyes are fixed on the holy pattern, which is the man Christ Jesus, then we can't see the flaws and errors of our brethren and our ministers. Because let me tell you, ministers are, and speakers, we'll, we'll say ministers and speakers, are praised too much and they're criticized too much. But what we need to remember is we are all human beings and there's nothing special about a minister. There's nothing special about a speaker. There is definitely not anything special about me. But we tend to lift people up and, and exalt them. And because we appreciate their ministry and it's understandable, but it's damaging. And um, what's equally as damaging is when we are critical because there are statements and I, I didn't put it in here, but there are many statements regarding what Ellen White has said about speakers and ministers and how they have all been wrong at different places in their, in their message. And they're on a journey too, and they're learning. So we have to, we really need to be less critical of people and be more supportive, be more loving with one another. We need to make special efforts to answer the prayer of Christ, that we may be one as he is one with the Father. He who declared himself actually straightened while in the days of his humiliation, because he had many things to say to his disciples, which they could not bear now. The wonders of redemption are dwelt upon all together too lightly. So, as I said earlier, Christ wanted to say many things to reprove the errant people, but he knew that they could not bear the reproof and he could lose them. You know, it's interesting when I think about the work of Christ, I don't see him reproving many people except for Pharisees. And what was the role of the Pharisee? The role of the Pharisee was to reprove people. That's what they did. They specialized in it. You know, how many steps did you take on the Sabbath? Are you carrying your bed? Did you pick that corn up off, uh, uh, off the plant on the Sabbath? I mean, we can go on and on and on. Um, and it seems to me like Christ was really vocal against the Pharisees because they did a lot of damage towards people. And Christ was very supportive and loving and patient. I remember in the upper, upper room experience when the disciples came in, and they were all fighting with each other. And they walked right past the water basin where you know you wash the feet in and, and or uh, the water pitcher and then the basin and all that, right? And the towels were neatly folded there. And they didn't even pay attention to that. And I know it was, I think it's the Desire of Ages says that Christ was feeling a lot of agony within himself because. There was a lot of things he wanted to say to them, but he knew that they couldn't handle it. They knew that they would, it would be detrimental to them to say it. So he did an act of love instead. He went and he poured the water into the basin and then he went to the disciple that probably loved him the least, which was Judas, and started with him. That's... I think that's why we are told to look at the life of Christ. In it, we find all the lessons that we need to understand what true Christianity is. And um, But the wonders of redemption are dwelt upon altogether 
too lightly, it says here at the end. And I believe in that as well. The questions we must ask ourselves um, after the study, I think, are important because I think we should always ask ourselves questions when to see, to get a sense of where we're at um, individually. Are we, and do you believe this? Are we still under the same experience of 1888 as what we just, by what we just seen? Do we still have the same party spirit that divides us? And if so, am I playing a role in that? Is the truth we are sharing fundamental and essential for our time? I believe that's, that is a very important question for each one of us. And, you know, God has a work for each, each and every one of us. And not every one of us is called to be a minister. Some of us are to be evangelists. Some of us are to work along the medical lines. Some of us are to be caregivers. Some of us are, I mean, the, the role, some of us are to help people in need. I mean, there is no shortage of, of things that God would have us to do. Um, but in all that, we do share a common message of hope, right? No matter which, which line of work that we are doing. And so in that message that we are sharing, are we leading out with, with certain messages that are of little to no relevance? Is our message too strong on any one point and out of balance? See, there's, there's this great framework that all works together. Ellen G. White once said in response to the flat earth theory that it matters not whether, the, whether it is round or flat, but rather is our character round, amen? Uh, that's a very important statement. So I ask, how many of us want to go forward today and lead by example as Christ did in the supper room? To put an end to the bickering and infighting amongst us that Christ's spirit may be poured out in full measure upon each and every one of us. How many of you want to go home today? How many of you are sick of this world? Let that be the meditation of our heart today. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we have had before us many lessons. It has been the example that whenever you have raised up prophets to speak to your people, there was a reformation and then a revival, and then there was a leading away. We have seen it time and time again, Father. Father, you have taught us many things over the years, over the, sir, the millennia. And Father, we fail sometimes to learn these lessons and we continue to repeat some of the same mistakes over and over again as a people. Father, we know there's not much time left in this world. We know that your spirit is being withdrawn, but may it not be withdrawn from our hearts. May it be growing. May, if it is being withdrawn from this world, Father, may it be placed in each and every one of us. Help us, Father, to love each other more perfectly. Help us, Father, to, to be the type of witnesses, not one that is perfect in message and perfect in understanding, but one that is perfect in love. That our hearts are drawn together and that we seek the common truths for our time that is so important and we unite and go forward in a mighty work. Father, we need your spirit. Help us, Father, in every way 
to save us. Help us to save others. May that always be our focus and our goal. Thank you for this time, Father. Thank you for this church. Bless them, Father. Bless them in their ministry. Bless them in their lives. Bless their families. And Father, help your people. I'm, I start with myself, Father. Help us, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>